Marsha, when do you use cabozantinib in medullary thyroid cancer? Okay, so I actually agree with what Frank said that when I need a rapid response, I have often gone to cabozantinib. And the reason for that really goes back to the clinical trials, and they were designed differently, so they answered a little bit of a different question. The Zeta trial actually did not require progressing patients. So the baseline of uh, progression free survival of 19 months says that, you know, it clearly is active, and we know that that, that, that included people who had indolent disease because the placebo arm went out that far. So I didn't have quite as much data on the people who progressed quickly. The people who progress quickly are the ones that have a progression-free survival more in the range of four months. And that really matched the eligibility criteria of the, of the exam trial. And so I have a little bit more confidence, although I think very good analysis was done on the Zeta trial to say that it's active in both. But because of that, I sometimes have leaned a little bit more towards cabozantinib in the aggressive patient. But I do think that we also have to remember there was quite a few incidences of fistula formation and deaths. So there really are sort of like two groups of patients. And it's not uncommon, and probably more common, I think, with medullary than with my differentiated thyroid cancers that I have people who've had tracheal invasion or you know, involvement around the esophagus. And those are the people who, with a rapid response, can actually create a hole that eventually leads to fistula and, and, and really life ending events. And so there's a black box warning with that. And so aggressive disease, I always have to take into mind whether or not there's, if there's ever any uh, radiation, I had one of those patients who died from that, so I saw it happen. Any kind of worry, even of cartilage invasion and things like that, I'll stay away from cabozantinib, and that might be something that I would then say, okay, I would rather start with vendentinib. The interesting thing is, however, that you know sometimes if there are not a lot of active I agents, you might have to take that risk eventually. Uh, but it's not a risk that I would take unless forced. In other words, second, I might try clinical trials, of course. I might try other kinase inhibitors. Manisha has some nice data in medullary with serafinib. So I'll try some of those first. Um, and, but if I have to, I'll, I might even have to give it, but it, I would stay away from it until the last resort. We have two active agents in medullary thyroid cancer. A little bit of a different toxicity profile uh, for the two. Um, sounds like a very individualized approach uh, in terms of deciding which one to use. Getting back to cabozantinib for a minute, uh, Nefa, let's talk about the common toxicities uh, associated with cabozantinib. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Um, um, yes, I'd like to. I'd also like to add to some comments that Marsha mentioned that are associated with the toxicities. Um, all of these drugs can cause fistulas and QT prolongation, but specifically the FDA has put a black box warning on vandetinib for QT prolongation and a black box warning on cabozantinib for fistula formation. So very important to keep um, you know, patient individualizing therapy and keeping the patients in mind, looking at EKGs, looking at um, associated therapy. Uh, the individual patient's tumor and having a multidisciplinary meeting. So when we talk about the toxicity specifically of fistula formation in cabozantinib involving the surgeon early on and even prior to the surgeon potentially thinking about radiation therapy and saying, okay, this is a patient who we know is going to get into trouble, who's most likely going to need some sort of systemic therapy. Is this somebody you really want to give, you know, radiation to because I'm worried about fistula if they're going to recur or, um, and having that discussion early on with the surgeon, endocrinologist, and medical oncologist. Uh, medical oncologist. Um, but other um, side effect, uh, ad adverse events from cabozantinib, um, in addition to fistula, you can get the hand foot, um, fatigue, um, diarrhea, managing those things up front, um, and also muscle wasting um, and asthenia and um, decreased appetite and just thinking about the overall patient and making sure we're checking the weights, the blood pressure. So sim some similar toxicities um, to some of the other uh, anti-VEGF therapies um, and perhaps it may have some uh, stronger VEGF inhibition. So some of those uh, toxicities do occur in higher grades and higher uh, percentages. I just add to a point about the weight loss. I think that's actually um, something that Oftentimes, we're worried about the other side effects. We don't take that into account. The cancer patients, they're on treatments, they're fatigued, whatnot. But I think there is a, a catabolic effect that, that can happen with these medications. So I think it's important to involve your dietitians um, when seeing these patients, especially if their weights you know, continue to fall. Um, I know we have implemented a program at our own center that has made a huge difference You know, when they have uh, regular follow-up with people who are actually following their weights, their body mass index, and you know, protein intake, et cetera. Marcia, uh, can you? I add to that? Do you, Sorry, wanna, you I've heard you mention about the muscle wasting and right. your approach to 
muscle wasting. You want to mention something? So, like that? so we actually we wrote this up in a paper. We were talking about actually managing serafinib, but all the VEGF receptors I think lead to what muscle wasting. And I, my hypothesis about this, I think, is that if you decrease blood flow, which is how this works, the, most of the VEGF receptor inhibitors work on, on the tumor, unfortunately, if you decrease blood flow to muscle, what happens? It wastes, you get wasting. And so what we do at our program is before, even during that surveillance period when they're not going to ever get therapy, I actually get them to the gym. I have 80-year-olds going to the gym, and I tell them I want them to lift weights and look like Michelle Obama. And I, so toning isn't what we're talking about here. I actually want them to bulk up. And what I do find, actually, is if they're actively doing that, usually at least twice a week, they total, the, the weight loss, they, they switch from that catabolic to not catabolic. They're less likely to lose weight. They have um, a, an ability to, to have less diarrhea, actually, and the fatigue. So it's amazing. I had a, I had a guy who... Of all my patients refuse, he's not the kind of guy who goes to the gym. He insists, I am not a gym kind of guy. To the point where he got so thin, I thought I could see through him. And, and he had, was getting a beautiful response on these agents for a very long time. And I, had to, I, was, I said, I'm going to have to stop it because you're going to die from basically starvation kind of thing. So he finally went to the gym. And it, it honestly, it freaked me out because honestly, a month later, two months later, he comes back. He looked 20 years younger. And he felt a ton better. His diarrhea had changed. He was no longer depressed. His energy had totally turned around. So that kind of general wasting, it's probably muscle, but it probably is totally systemic, can be, I believe, turned around. And that's sort of one of our tricks. And has been a, it's really, as I said, 80-year-olds going to the gym have actually felt better with that. Well, we, we talked about...